exciting, and thank you very much. I'll be around for the whole conference. So. So the, the rules of the game are that in theory this is over in 20 minutes or so. You're welcome. Jeff is welcome to go on and uh, you're welcome to stay. The next thing is lunch and some time to yourself. So I'd like you to give your attention. This is exciting stuff. Thank you. Joe Cliff from UMass Boston. Chris Burns from UMass Edwards. This presentation we're about to make is actually very apropos to the two other presentations that just occurred. <coughs> we are going to talk rather quickly now about characterizing a set of charters that we looked at in terms of plant water use efficiency. And we used four pitch pine scrub oak species from Massachusetts in order to conduct this research in pot trials, in Waltham Mass, and in C2, in Plymouth Mass. Questions we asked previously, which we uh, try to get answers for and report in Sonoma last year were about respiration of carbon over time, depending on the type of treatment of a clay, whether it's clay alone, biochar treated. The second question we asked was, was there going to be an effect of biochar directly on survival rates of pitch pine scrub oak species? We actually found that in three or four, Three or four cases there were. Wait, this is the wrong. Uh, this is the wrong. Um, <laughs> I just realized. One moment while we switch to a slightly this different is actually topic wrong. that is sparingly more relevant. You loaded the. <laughs> no, no, you loaded. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Hey, do this talk. This is a great talk. Okay. It changed my life. <laughs> Wasted a thousand okay. hours of my okay. time in the lab. Let's try this again. <laughs> Let's see. You might want to remember this. I didn't see another one on there. Uh, it was under. Yeah, I don't know where it went. Okay. Huh. If we were to sign it. Let's take more McShields questions. These things have been known to suck up massive amounts of people. Suck up. <laughs> and just can work behind it. Okay, you want your second question? I do. My second question. Is it still who cares? Oh, okay. <laughs> on your butane test, what's a good number on that butane test on a percentage? Of it's about the same as these R134. So a, a good activated carbon will be about 20% to 25% butane activity. So okay. To find a, so a carbon would be, a, a good char will be a quarter to a half of that number. So 5 to 10% butane is pretty good. But I want to remind you that butane is moving a long ways away from the actual energies that are used in the absorption in soils. That's the problem. You're measuring some very low energy absorption phenomena. He's on. Thank you. Uh, confusion stem from the back. Yeah, I loaded on earlier, but somehow it got away from us. So we are going to talk about that later in about two hours. But for this talk, we're going to be talking about the effect of biochars on three different tests, which do relate to the two papers that you just heard. One is volumetric soil moisture, the other is shrinkage, and the other is plasticity. Normally, volume, uh, volumetric soil moisture works really well for a variety of tests, but, but, but for shrinkage and plasticity, those are used by civil engineers, environmental engineers, to look at the foundations of buildings and soils underneath, and is there going to be effect from shrinkage and plasticity on structure? But we're not looking at that. We're not looking at structure. We're looking at the effect of biochar on soils in Massachusetts. The questions we asked previously, I just went into, uh, that was about field respiration and about survival rates. And what we did was we found out that there was a reason to continue our biochar research because after looking at those factors, we thought maybe we need to look more specifically at soil moisture. So this year we added a number of different questions. One was, how did the chars that we're gonna look at affect volumetric soil moisture shrinkage and plasticity? Is there one in particular of the charts that we're looking at that's going to have the most effect or impact? Um, what's going to be the best overall performer? And what conclusions can we draw from one of the charts that we're going to look at, which was Licht McLaughlin? Here you see McLaughlin on the top, the R, UMass, Boston, contraption on the bottom. It's the same T LUD, but we just moved it from Belchertown down to Walkin. You can see on the right that there's four different charts. 
Fox B, Fox C, and SPF were created by McLaughlin, and the Lick McLaughlin at the bottom was created by me uh, with the help of you. We looked at four different soils, soils to study. Uh, they were non hybrid sandy looms from Middlesex County, where I am, and we looked at four regional soils from that county that we could characterize in our lab. You know, we looked at, especially at bulk density, we looked at volume, which is not volume, as it says here, and percolation attributes. And the tests were pretty straightforward. These haven't been done before with biochar, but there's no reason, as you will see when we're done, why anybody couldn't do these. Again, what the goals were to try to get some data out of these tests. First one we did was an air dry test. Um, the test was fairly simple. We just took 40 different samples of different blends and we put them in an open window in a lab for 22 days and it was about a, a three to five mile knot uh, air current, so it was very, very minimal. We looked at different concentrations of biochar because we wanted to look at what effects might accrue from varying the amount of char in the soil. We also used sand controls. On day one, we found that the liquid glaucon char had an extraordinary uh, high uh, uh, saturation level. And when it was blended in with, with the, uh, the WCSA, which was one of the, uh, the nine hybrid soils, it was uh, pretty substantial in holding moisture. But by day 11, we, we found that it was still substantial in holding, holding moisture. It wasn't until day 15, 16, 17 in this trial that we began to see a moderating of soil moisture capacity. And finally, by day 22, we saw that there was a lot of change. And by day 22, the soil, the native soil without any amendment, was holding more moisture than any of the treated uh, WCSAs with either SPF, uh, the two different boxes, and the loop of law. But I thought this was a, a substantial interest, and I'm going to point out later why I think it's, it's a very telling uh, clue. Um, one of the things that we didn't control for uh, as much as we might have was, was wind. I mean, we couldn't set up a fan. Frank, wanted, Frank Shields, who directed all this, wanted me to set up maybe a fan inside the lab to have a very, very steady flow of air. That does make sense. Um, I said, if we do it by an open window and it's minimal wind, will that work? He said, sure. But one of the things we could do in future would be to moderate the wind effect and obviously try to control for other conditions. Um, what we are constantly re, re, uh, revising what we're doing in Waltham. And one of the things that we're doing is setting up a whole bunch of pod studies now with a, a wide variety of plants to try to look at all this uh, in, in open air testing, if you will. We also did an oven dry test. Now, I know that we only use 60 degrees centigrade, and can you just refer to the fact that you really need 150, 175, 200? But we did it over two days, and we thought that was sufficient to get enough dehydration to then rehydrate over and over and over to see if there are any differences. And um, what we found was that over time, the same two chars kept coming through with the same increase in moisture and then a steady uh, uh, absorption of that. And that was the, the liquid block at 1% and the SPF at 20%. We did a second test, the shrinkage test. Again, this is not used typically, I don't think, for biochar experiments, but what we did was we wanted to see how much a clay would shrink. So if the clay is, you know, 100% out here and it goes in 1, 2, 3, 4%, we know that there's a, definitely a change, and that change is going to impact on the amount of water that that soil is going to hold. It's also going to impact if there's cracks in the soil, in the field, or in a pot, anyway. You're going to have filtration, you're going to have loss of water. So we did, we did this uh, shrinkage test. And what we found was that there was uh, a lot of shrinkage going on uh, with uh, the non-biochar soil and 2 to 4% less shrinkage with the biochar treated soils. Again, this is a tiny bit of shrinkage, but if you magnify this over an enormous area like a field, you can readily see that there is a implication there. Here's an example of what we were looking at. The most important data are the, the blue outline data and the red outline data. So we were looking at percentage of, of, of diameter after shrinkage was taking place, and we looked at the mean shrinkage factor. And we, we did that for many, many, many samples in order to come out with uh, uh, some clues. 
with the shrinkage data, we found that, that uh, the, the LM, the, the liquid globulin, uh, yielded the least shrinkage. And uh, that's something to, to keep in mind as we go through still a third test. The third test was looking at plastic limits. Again, plastic limits are usually for other kinds of civil and environmental studies. But we looked at it because we wanted to see how much water would evaporate from a roll test, rolling back and forth of clays by themselves or clays with biochar, to see how much water would evaporate. And we found that in this case, unlike the, the patty test that you just saw, there was definitely a, a you know, significant change, 8 to 13% water loss uh, for the NHSLs, the, the, the pure clays, and 11 to 20 percent, 27 percent loss for the treated. So for the plastic limit test, you're trying, you're trying to see how much water is escaping, and that's actually a good thing because according to Shields, when you're losing water uh, and, and it's being, being rolled out, that means that that's water that's available to the plants in the soil column. That's a really important thing to know because that's another way of saying that the char has an effect on water holding capacity in the soil, independent from the volumetric and from the shrinkage. Here's the plasticity data, and as you can see on the far right, the lime green or bright green, you can see how much more dramatic the soil moisture is on that slide. So here are the conclusions. While we found that there was um, soil moisture being held even with 1% char, which is a tiny, you have to admit, 1% is a tiny, tiny fraction of the total soil column. So even with 1%, we were seeing a difference. But the problem was that we didn't see conclusive evidence that one particular char over four concentrations was holding more water than any other char for the untreated soils. What we did find was that the non-wood lignocellulosic biochar, the lignoglobin char, did hold enough water, we felt, that we could project into having about a 10% savings in irrigation requirement or if there's no storm events um, in a field, given that all the other factors were the same. You know, rainfall, wind, all those other factors. We thought that was significant because we, we realized that these are tests which can be repeated over and over and over anywhere in the world without fancy equipment, without chemical standards. If, if IBI is looking for standards for testing, we can't think, and this is Shields working, we can't think, oh, I can't, I claim 130. Um, it's really great to know that anybody, anywhere, without fancy equipment can take these tests and within, you know, hours begin to understand what they've got in terms